Have you ever had a bad day when nothing seems to go right? I, I bet there are some heads nodding out there right now. Let me put that another way. Have you ever had a good day <laughs> when everything is going your way? You like the good days because they kind of energize you, right? One thing leads to another. You start to think maybe, hey, I can walk on water. <laughs> Everything's just going fine, right? Just as you don't like the bad days because they make you want to run and hide, one disaster after the other, um, the good days, things just seem to add up. What you need to know is that the most spiritually significant days for you are the bad days. Days which are difficult enough to make you needy, difficult enough to make others need you. Hmm. Well, there's no mail delivery in our little town, so everybody had to go down to the post office where everybody had a box, including the church. The postmaster was a strange, talkative man named Chris. And because he was also a church member, a trip to the post office for me meant a long one-way conversation with Chris. He just wouldn't leave a gap in the conversation where I could say, well, I got to get going, right? Well, one of the things that made conversation kind of odd with Chris was the fact that he never, he had this habit of talking to you, but not looking you in the eye, instead looking off over your shoulder. Well, I eventually found out why he did this. Chris had served in the Pacific during World War II he'd been captured by the Japanese. The name of the officer in charge, the nickname of the officer in charge of the prison camp was the Beast of the East. Chris had suffered a number, a string of bad days. There were death marches, there was torture, there was uh, imprisonment and inter interrogation. Chris had learned the hard way not to look his captors in the eye. After the war, Chris became the postmaster of our little town, and he also became an alcoholic. Now, he would try to hide this by walking around in the backyard. He'd mix gin in um, a bottle of soda pop, and then he'd walk around, stroll around, looking like he was checking things out. <laughs> But this didn't fool anyone, including the pastor. Sometimes Jesus had his bad days. Yes. Like the day he preached in his hometown synagogue at Nazareth, right? His reputation had preceded him. They'd heard that he could heal and he could work wonders. And when he preached, he was very good and very wise and very true. But you see, people don't always respond well to the truth and to wisdom. They don't. Sometimes they'll try to find some flaw, some reason not to take the truth seriously, something to left, let them off the hook. And in Nazareth, they said, oh, wait a minute. Where does he get all this stuff? All right. Isn't this the carpenter? He's just a tradesperson like ourselves. Isn't he Mary's son? Notice that they left Joseph out, kind of hinting Jesus might be illegitimate. We, we know his brothers and his sisters. They've married into our families. So he's one of us, and so he can't be much. Now, you see, they rejected Jesus not because they didn't think so much of him, but because they didn't think so much of themselves. Thinking this, they did not have to take Jesus' words to heart. They could stumble along the same old way. The Bible says that Jesus could do no mighty work there. It was a bad day. There was no walking on water that day. Well, I remember one particularly bad day. Of all things, it was a vacation day. I was riding on Ragbri, uh, the big bike ride across Iowa. It's coming up in a few weeks. One day we were riding out of Cedar Rapids in a light rain, but then just as we were approaching the little town of Ellie, that's how you say that, isn't it? The rain just let loose. It came down in buckets. Now to make things wor worse, I was riding in a pack of riders, and so there's hundreds of 
bicycle tires flinging dirty water up off the road and throwing it up in the air. <laughs> now, are you familiar with the tight little bike shorts that bikers wear? There's padding in the seat. You know, and it's a nice thing when it's when they're dry. <laughs> okay. In the rain, your rear tire throws gallons of water right at your butt. <laughs> and the padding gets soaked. Then it's not just a matter of being wet. It's like wearing a wet diaper. <laughs> well, after that lousy day in his hometown, Jesus sent his disciples out two by two. They are to go to a bunch of other towns and villages all around there. And stranger still, he tells the disciples not to take anything with them. The disciples are just supposed to be traveling light, not just traveling light, but running on empty, nothing with them. Now I want you to see the genius in this plan that Jesus has. First, there's, there's this wonderful freedom when you don't carry nothing, no excess baggage, no baggage at all, right? <laughs> just themselves. There's nothing to distract the disciples from their mission. And this freedom is going to lead them eventually into friendship. They are going to be driven into relationship with others by their needs. The disciples come into a town. They're tired and they're thirsty. They go to the village well, the center of life in that village. They will have to ask someone to draw water for them, just like Jesus did once. Then they will need to pay close attention to the people because they're going to need to find out who, who might share food with strangers, who might put a stranger up for the night. Now, who do you think would feel the obligation to help wandering disciples? Or who do you think would understand what it's like to have these needs? Who, who would understand that? Well, needy people. Quite often someone who is poor, or someone who has been poor. Before they're through, you see, the disciples are going to know the network of this village. They're going to know how it works. And many people are going to know why they came and who it was that sent them, none other than Jesus Christ. Well, by the time I reached Ellie, I was a wet, dirty, soppy mess. But there, on the left, was a church. And those good folks were serving breakfast to the sodden masses that were rolling into their town in the rain. Now, my good friend, Leroy, was pastor of this church. So I decided that I would try to find him or his wife, Paula, and maybe they could take care of me for a while. Well, I stopped at the church and neither one of them were there just then, so I went down the street to the parsonage. I went to the back door and knocked. No one seemed to be home. Door was open, just the screen door closed. So I knew they couldn't be too far away. In fact, I, well, <laughs> I tried the door and it was unlocked. But then I thought, I'm having a dilemma. Even though these are my good friends, should I invite myself into their house uninvited? Should I find a towel, take off my wet clothes, Maybe put them in the dryer for a while. Maybe run a load of wash and get the clothes both dry and clean. Maybe I could take a shower and get myself clean, <laughs> right? But then I thought, what if um, a neighbor or one of their children or a mother-in-law or somebody innocent came back while I was still there, all right, standing in the basement with no clothes on? How was I going to explain that? And could I explain it fast enough? Now, if you're a wandering disciple, and if you have only one set of clothes, what do you think you're going to do when they get dirty? Someone will have to wash them for you. And while they do, you are not going anywhere. <laughs> you're going to have to be somewhere with no clothes on in a dependent, vulnerable situation. Think about that. And where, where are the conversations going? You're going to have a conversation with that person while they're washing your clothes. Well, back at my bike ride, as the rain came down in LA, Iowa, I decided just not be right to be found naked in, in somebody's basement, even a friend's basement. But I also have to admit, admit this. 
I don't really like to be needy. I don't like to be dependent and vulnerable. It's not something that I want to do, um, even with my friends. So I went and stood in the garage for a while and waited for them to come home, but apparently they were busy elsewhere. It's too bad they didn't come home while I was there because some different things might have happened. First, they would have liked to have seen me, especially all wet and dirty, and they'd enjoy helping me out. They really would. I would have run around the house maybe in Leroy's uh, bathrobe, and we could have had a memory to share for the rest of our lives and could have saved me a bad case of diaper rash. You see, we prefer to conduct our relationships out of strength and independence, not out of weakness and dependence. But here, you see, Jesus sends his messages out, messengers out as the small, as the strange, as the powerless, who rather than meeting every need that people have, they have needs themselves. These needs move people to help them, and they are drawn into relationship with not just the messengers, but with Jesus himself. One wonders if, if you, as a congregation, if you were to speak of your needs to others, the need for leadership, the need for help, would people respond? I think they would. I think they would, would if, you, if you worked out of your weaknesses. Another time, another place. I was not having a very good day. You know, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes being a pastor just isn't the honor that it's cracked up to be. I'll tell you that. I don't remember who or what was bothering me. All I know is that I went home, I was disgusted with myself, I was disgusted maybe with other people, I was disgusted with life in general. And then the phone rang and I thought, wonderful, some new church problem. What well, turns out to be Chris, the postmaster, and this guy is strange, he never really ever called me, he always caught me down at the post office. He says, I just called to see what you were doing. And so we talked for a while, and I have to tell you that uh, on the phone I didn't know, notice Chris's eyes so much. Couldn't smell his breath. Well, I could, I could almost smell his breath, but not quite. Right before he hung up, he said it. He said, you're my good friend, you know. You're my pastor guy. No, not much to that, was there? Do you have any idea how enormous that was? You are my pastor guy. It was like being ordained all over again. Now, you can expect your bad days, you see, to be your spiritually significant days. Days which are difficult enough to make you needy, because you need to be needy. And there are days when whose difficulties will cause others, others to, to need you, others that, that need something that perhaps only you can give. Because that's how our Lord works. That's how our Lord comes to us. In fact, that's, that's how and when he is able to come to you. When there's nothing else to get in the way, that's when Christ can make his presence known. And then what happens is people get healed and problems go running for cover. Amen. <laughs>